Hi everyone, uh, I am Michael. Uh, I've been working with Tauk uh, as a, a tour director on the Rhine River for uh, three years. Uh, for 10 years, I've been working as a maestro on their uh, musical magic on the Blue Danube uh, River cruises, uh, doing musical performances and lectures. Uh, so I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to uh, talk to you about uh, something that I love, music and uh, Beethoven, and I'm thrilled that there are so many people who are interested in this, uh, in this topic. Uh, so this is a big year for Beethoven. Uh, this year we celebrate Beethoven's 250th birth year. Uh, Beethoven is celebrated today as one of the greatest, uh, if not the greatest composer of all time. So I'd like to take this opportunity to talk about why Beethoven is still so celebrated after all of these years. Uh, the easy answer is his music. He wrote great music. But this is also the most difficult answer since what it is that makes music great, this is a question without a satisfactory answer. Uh, I will talk about his music uh, a little bit. I'll touch on some of his most famous works, but uh, I'll never talk in too much depth about the music. I'll never talk too technical uh, about the music. Uh, what I'm mostly going to be talking about is uh, Beethoven's life, his life story. And when I talk about his music, I'll place it within the context of his biography. There's a connection uh, between the life and the work, what Beethoven was experiencing and what he was composing that is worth exploring. And arguably his personality, uh, his character is as important as his music. Additionally, since no artist is living in a vacuum, but is responding to the world around them, I'll also be talking about uh, the historical circumstances in which Beethoven was living, uh, the political changes, uh, the social changes, the changes in the arts and the thinking about the arts that were happening when Beethoven was composing. All these things together, uh, life experience, plus what was going on in the world around him, all contributed to the way that Beethoven wrote music. Uh, Beethoven was born in Bonn on the Rhine. You can see it's not too far from Cologne. Uh, Bonn was an important city at this time. It's where the Archbishop of Cologne had his residence, his court. Uh, the Archbishop at the time was Maximilian Francis, a brother of two Holy Roman Emperors, uh, Joseph II and Leopold II. Uh, Maximilian Francis was one of the seven prince electors of the Holy Roman Empire, one of the most powerful men in Europe. Uh, this meant, among other things, a lot of interest in and money for uh, the arts and for music. Uh, the Beethovens were a musical family. This is uh, Grandpa Beethoven, also Ludwig. Uh, he was a Kapellmeister at the Electoral Chapel. The Kapellmeister is the highest ranking uh, musician in town. This is Beethoven's father, uh, Johann. Uh, we can see where Beethoven got his sunny disposition. Uh, Johann sang tenor in the Electoral Chapel. And uh, our young Ludwig, starting when he was age 12, was the organist in the Electoral uh, Chapel. Uh, Johann, the father, he was in charge of the musical education of his three sons. Ludwig was the oldest. And uh, Johann recognized the musical gifts of his son from a very early age. Uh, he had the, the idea to mold his son Ludwig uh, in the vein of the child prodigy Mozart. Remember, it was in the 1760s, so in the previous decade, that the six-year-old Wolfgang traveled all over Europe, performing for and dazzling the aristocracy, making the family loads of money in the process. Johann figured he may as well exploit, rather, he may as well share his son's musical gifts with the world as well. This plan uh, didn't quite work out. Uh, Johann uh, was not uh, a great father. Uh, he was an alcoholic and he was uh, physically abusive. And uh, since uh, he was such uh, a disaster, uh, it fell upon the young Ludwig to take up the mantle as head of the family at a very early age. Uh, in the face of all these challenges, young Ludwig excelled as a pianist and composer in Bonn, 
and found the support of uh, the upper echelon. When Ludwig was around 20 years old, the family's new plan, with the support of the archbishop, was to send Ludwig to Vienna to study with Mozart. Here again is Bonn, and seven days journey brings you to Vienna. When, by the time that Beethoven, by the time that Beethoven finally moved to uh, Vienna at the end of 1792, uh, Mozart was already deceased. He died at the end of 1791. Uh, Beethoven instead studied with Joseph Haydn, then the most uh, respected musician in Vienna, as well as with Antonio Salieri, whom you know if you've seen the film Amadeus. Uh, spoiler alert, Salieri did not kill Mozart or Beethoven. In the 1790s, in Vienna, Beethoven quickly found success, especially in the city's aristocratic salons. His reputation was built on his amazing skill as a pianist, his virtuosity, as well as his ability to improvise, to make up music on the spot without any preparation. In Vienna, Beethoven found an aristocracy that was particularly inclined toward music and was eager to support music. Four of Beethoven's most generous patrons, uh, the princes Lishnovsky, Kinsky, and Lobkowitz, as well as the Archduke Rudolf Habsburg. Beethoven uh, taught the Archduke Rudolf a piano and composition, and the two of them seem to have had a, a very strong uh, affection for one another. So in other words, a Beethoven moves to Vienna and he makes friends with its most powerful inhabitants. Now, just a word about uh, this portrait and the rest of the Beethoven portraits in the presentation. Uh, the year in the lower corner, in this case, 1801, it will always show you the year in which the portrait was painted. So this, a roughly 30-year-old Beethoven. Uh, Beethoven's friends described the 30-year-old composer as a small and inconspicuous person with an ugly face riddled with pockmarks. Nice. You can imagine what Beethoven's enemies said. Uh, it was in this decade that Beethoven wrote two of his most famous compositions, the Piano Sonata Pathétique and the Moonlight Sonata. Uh, now I'm gonna play the first musical example. You may have to turn your audio uh, on your computer up or down depending. It's gonna start very quietly, but it will come. This is the beginning of the first movement of the Moonlight Sonata. Beethoven did not call it the uh, Moonlight Sonata. That's a name that was given to it uh, years later by a poet. Uh, Beethoven called it a sonata quasi una fantasia, like a fantasy. Uh, the fantasy was an important musical genre, type of music in the classical period. Uh, it has no set form. It's a free composition. The idea is that a fantasia shows the composer's fantasy their imagination in that in a fantasy, the composer can reveal their innermost thoughts, their feelings, their true self. Now, this first movement shows us one side of Beethoven, the composer, the sensitive melancholic side. The third movement shows us another side of Beethoven, which also won him great praise, his virtuosic fiery side. 
this movement shows us Beethoven, the dazzling virtuoso, playing so many notes so fast. This aggressive, loud music that Beethoven created was something new, unheard of in Vienna. Beethoven would play the piano with his full hands, often breaking the piano strings. Beethoven became famous for this kind of musical vigor. Now let's go back to this picture. I love this picture. I know what you're thinking. That guy has fallen asleep as Beethoven is playing the piano. But no, 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 he's not fallen asleep. He is moved, emotionally moved by Beethoven's piano playing. There are many accounts of the effect Beethoven's playing had on his listeners. I want to read one for you because it speaks volumes about Beethoven the person, his personality. This is a description of Beethoven's playing uh, by one of Beethoven's students, Carl Czerny. Beethoven's improvisation was most brilliant and striking, Czerny writes. In whatever company he might chance to be, he knew how to produce such an effect upon every hearer that frequently not an eye remained dry, while many would break out into loud sobs. For there was something wonderful in his expression. In addition to the beauty and originality of his ideas and his spirited style of rendering them. After ending an improvisation of this kind, Beethoven would burst into loud laughter and banter his hearers on the emotion he had caused in them. You are fools, he would say. Sometimes Beethoven would feel himself insulted by these indications of sympathy. Who can live among such spoiled children? He would cry, oh boy. When we think of Beethoven, we think of a melancholic, a serious, grumpy fellow. This shows us Beethoven's legendary sense of humor. Now, let's step back from Beethoven for a second and talk about what was going on in Europe in the 1790s. This is the storming of the Bastille, the beginning of the French Revolution. And four years later, uh, execution of the King Louis XVI. Europe would be at war for the next 20 years. Thanks to uh, this man, Napoleon, the general who first became, who became the first consul and then crowned himself emperor in 1804. So Europe was racked by war. Vienna was occupied twice by French armies in 1799 and 1805. What this meant for music and composers and Beethoven was the bankruptcy of the aristocracy. The system of patronage that had sustained music for the past 200 years was over. Uh, but luckily, this was, this was also the time of the rise of the middle class as a patron of music. Now, Beethoven was an exception here. Uh, in 1809, he convinced uh, three of his patrons, uh, the Prince Kinski, Lobkowitz, and the Archduke Rudolf, to pay him an annual stipend so that Beethoven could live and compose without any financial worry. But again, this was the exception. Now, for everybody else, it was... A music publication where the composers made their money. It was through the opera house, it was in the concert hall, and it was making music uh, in the home. How people were thinking about the arts and artists was also changing. Uh, these are paintings by Kaspar David Friedrich. He shows landscapes veiled in darkness or mists with only faint sources of light. This new way of perceiving the world, what would be called romanticism, emphasizes the mysterious, the unknown. Because of this attraction to the unknown powers, the romantics prized music above the other arts, the art form that does not depict anything concretely, but can move us more than any other art. Beethoven and his music were perfectly poised to give a new generation exactly what they wanted. In literature, romanticism comes out of the writings of this man, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, 
father of the German language, the Shakespeare of the German language. Uh, Goethe became internationally famous for his novel, The Sorrows of Young Werther. Uh, Werther was hopelessly in love with a woman who was engaged to another man. This rarely turns out well. In his grief, Werther commits suicide. Goethe later revealed that in writing this story, he drew on his own life experience together with a true story he had heard about a young man who had committed suicide. What Goethe brought to literature and art is the idea that the artist informs his artwork with his life experience. A life and work are connected. This is also the beginning of a new concept for the artist, the genius. Before the turn of the 19th century, artists were considered craftsmen, skilled workers performing a task for which they were paid. Uh, Mozart, for example, who died in 1791, spent most of his life in the employ of the Archbishop of Salzburg. Mozart was considered a servant, one of the many who made up the Archbishop's court. The concept of genius brings the artist, the composer, out of this role of, of craftsman. The composer works through inspiration, is a kind of prophet. Uh, the genius has access to a greater vision and a knowledge which allows the artist to create inspired works of art that speak eternal truths. Along with this ability comes a particular personality. Uh, the artist lives outside social norms. Beethoven provides the model here. Beethoven was ill-tempered, often disheveled, and even though he walked in aristocratic circles, he was often uncourteous toward his patrons. Patron, Beethoven's patrons allowed this kind of behavior because they admired his music. Goethe and Beethoven did meet. The story of their encounter gives us a glimpse into Beethoven's character and what this idea of genius allowed. This is a, a painting of, of the meeting between Beethoven and Goethe. It was made years after the event. Uh, Beethoven and Goethe, they met in a spa town, Teplitz. They're having a stroll when the emperor and empress with their retinue approach. And Goethe executes a deep formal bow as a royalty passes him. You can see him bowing over there to the left. Beethoven tells Goethe, they should make way for us, not us for them. Beethoven puts on his hat, crosses his arms, and walks right past the royal pair. After meeting Beethoven, Goethe wrote to a friend that his talent amazed me. However, unfortunately, he is an utterly untamed personality. And not all in the wrong if he finds the world detestable, but he thereby does not make it more enjoyable either for himself or others. On his side, Beethoven wrote that Goethe delights far too much in the court atmosphere, far more than is becoming a poet. This shows us too that these concepts of genius were not universal. Beethoven and Goethe were two very different personalities, different exemplars of genius. When we get into the first decade of the 19th century, we see Beethoven becoming the dominant composer in Vienna, reaching the peak of his public fame. We call this period his heroic period because many of his compositions from this time, compositions that were his most famous in his day and still are today, suggest heroism to us. Here is a list of his key works. First and foremost, his third symphony, the Eroica, the Heroic, originally titled Bonaparte. Uh, Beethoven intended, we think, to dedicate the symphony to Napoleon. Uh, Beethoven composed eight of his nine symphonies within this first a decade of the 19th century. The musical characteristics that Beethoven drew on to create this heroic style were principally musical characteristics found on the opera stage, and in particular, musical effects made popular by French revolutionary opera. Uh, 
operas that were performed in France during the revolution. We don't hear these distinctions so clearly today, but in Beethoven's time, audience expected and heard different sounds from an opera, uh, from a symphony or oratorio, and from a string quartet. Beethoven brought the sounds of opera, of the theater, the drama, the excitement, the suspense, to the symphony. The clearest example, the easiest to hear, is Beethoven's use of the trombone in his symphonies. Beethoven's fifth symphony is the first time trombones were used outside of opera. Since with the concept of genius, with the advent of romanticism, the connections of life and work become so important, let's look at Beethoven's life uh, in these years. This wedge shape is a hearing spectrum. Uh, Beethoven went deaf over a course of about 20 years. He mentions some trouble hearing in 1797 and was completely deaf by 1818. We don't know much about the progress of his going deaf. While there was a steady decline in his ability to hear, his hearing also seems to have been better or worse on any given day. It was beginning around 1800 that Beethoven transitioned away from being primarily a virtuosic performer to become primarily a composer, but it isn't necessarily that he couldn't play because he couldn't hear. Uh, Beethoven, while a successful pianist, often acted as if performing were beneath him, a menial activity. He was happy to let his pupils perform his compositions in his stead. Beethoven would perform in concerts of his own music, and he did so into the 1810s. There is an important document from this time that shows the emotional impact of going deaf. Uh, Beethoven wrote what we call the Heiligenstadt Testament in 1802. In this document, Beethoven laments his hearing loss, saying that it leads him to isolation, where he'd rather be surrounded by people, because since he is a composer, how could he possibly reveal that he couldn't hear? And what would his enemies say if they found out, he wonders. The Heiligenstadt Testament was supposedly written for his two brothers, though he never sent it to them. It was only discovered after his death in 1827. In this document, Beethoven goes so far as to say that he contemplated suicide. He could not go through with it, however, for the sake of his art. Beethoven believed that he had a purpose as a composer, a purpose for humanity. And for this sake, he would not give up, but would continue to struggle for the sake of his fellow man. In the face of this personal crisis, Beethoven was extremely productive. He composes fervently at this time of great personal struggle, composing some of his most famous works right around this time. Uh, Beethoven's internal struggles from this time also surround this woman, the so-called immortal beloved, an unnamed woman whom Beethoven was in love with and hoped to be with to marry, though it proved impossible. Who this woman was fascinated Beethoven scholars for 250 years. Well, not that many, not, not that long. <laughs> Until today, it still does. Uh, in 1977, a scholar suggested what seems to me the most probable candidate, but who, I, who it was, I think, is not as important as uh, what she represented. She was not the only woman that Beethoven fell in love with or proposed marriage to. Beethoven fell in love a handful of times, each time to a similar result. Each time he fell in love, it was with a woman he could not have because she was married, because of class difference, or because of age difference. Beethoven loved, but could never have his love turned. What is uh, significant about the immortal beloved is that this romance in 1812 
was the conclusion of Beethoven's hopes to marry, resigning himself to bachelorhood thereafter. Now let's turn to one of Beethoven's heroic works to see how life and uh, work can be seen to interact. Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is one of the most popular symphonies ever written. Uh, everyone knows this opening motive. This rhythmic motive becomes something like a character recurring, through, recurring throughout the four movements of the symphony. This process of thematic unity, a binding a whole symphony together with small musical units, is something we find in much of Beethoven's music. On the one hand, the motive is a kind of anchor, something for us to listen for and recognize throughout the symphony. And in its various appearances, it also suggests process or narrative, the idea that a story is unfolding. Let's listen to a bit of the first movement. The movement begins with restless agitation in the minor mode, dark and stormy. The course of the movement and the course of the whole symphony is like a battle, a struggle. Uh, these dark and foreboding sounds contrasting with more lyrical and joyous music. When we get to the last movement, we finally get our victory. <laughs> This uh, musical narrative, despair, struggle, and victory, uh, we find in many of Beethoven's compositions from these years, from this heroic period. They're easy to understand as reflections of Beethoven's own life circumstances, even if Beethoven never said that that was what he was doing, uh, writing compositions to express his inner life. It is an effective way to listen to his music. And as a musical narrative, or process that recurs in many of his works, it does tie much of his music together stylistically so that as listeners, once we are familiar with this narrative, we can listen for it and hear it in his other works. The first decade of the 19th century was a great success for Beethoven. He became recognized as the greatest composer in Vienna. His works were published and performed internationally but the second decade was not so great. Uh, Beethoven goes from being an eccentric to being considered a madman by the Viennese. Letters from his friends described him as looking like a beggar. He was so dirty in his dress. In his manner, he was like a bear, sulky and difficult. When he laughed, it was like a scream. He would call people names as he passed them in the street. He became like a wild animal whenever he was irritated. This resemblance heightened when he frequently allowed his beard to grow unchecked. And nonetheless, the author Grillparzer tells us, for all of his odd ways, often bordering on the offensive, there was something so inexpressibly touching and noble in him that one could not but esteem him and feel drawn to him. In 1815, Beethoven finds himself with a new set of personal struggles, this time surrounding his family. Beethoven's younger brother, Karl Kaspar, was married in 1806 and had a son, Karl, later that year. Kaspar was sick with tuberculosis for many years, finally dying in 1815. In his will, Kaspar named his older brother Ludwig 
his son's guardian. Carl was nine years old at the time. A codicil appended to the will named Carl's mother as co-guardian. The short version of the story is four and a half years of acrimonious legal battles between Beethoven and the mother, guardianship going back and forth before finally being granted to Beethoven in 1820. During these years, Beethoven's productivity dropped precipitously. In 1817, he composed next to nothing. During all these guardianship battles, Beethoven never lived with his nephew. Carl was always at a boarding school. It wasn't until the end of 1823 that Carl lived with Beethoven for the first time. Uh, their relationship became quite strained. They loved each other, they did, but they also hated each other. It was, it seems, uh, too much trauma and stress for the young Carl. In the summer of 1826, uh, Carl attempted suicide. Uh, Beethoven was, of course, devastated by this. Uh, Beethoven's health was never great, and now, after Carl's attempted uh, suicide, Beethoven's health got much worse. Uh, abdominal pain, pain in his joints, and trouble with his eyes. Beethoven died months after Carl's attempted suicide on 26 March 1827. The autopsy uh, indicates cirrhosis of the liver caused either by hepatitis or alcohol and related multiple organ failure. Beethoven's funeral on the 29th of March was a public event in Vienna with a reported 10,000 in attendance. In his will, Beethoven bequeathed his entire estate to his nephew, Karl. Let's get back uh, to the music. Uh, beginning in 1818, Beethoven's productivity picks up again. He composes, among others, the following works, one of his most famous among them, the Ninth Symphony, completed in 1824. This, Beethoven's last symphony, is famous in part for its last fourth movement, for which Beethoven uses a chorus and vocal soloists. This was unheard of in a symphony. A symphony is instrumental music, no voices, no words, but when Beethoven composed this symphony, mostly in 1823, he had a concrete message that he wanted to express. And to do that, he turned to a poem by Friedrich Schiller. Uh, with Goethe, Schiller was the other father of German literature. Schiller's poem is On die Freude, what we call Ode to Joy. The first three movements of the symphony proceed with only the instruments, in the overall style, the symphony is like the heroic works of 20 years previous. The symphony starts in the minor mode. It's agitated and mysterious. We have a struggle between light and dark. Finally, in the fourth movement, after 50 minutes of music, we get musical chaos broken by a bass soloist. And just a word on the text. This was a question that was sent in in advance. Uh, these first lines, that the, the bass sings, these are words that Beethoven himself wrote as a sort of transition from the purely instrumental into the vocal music. Beethoven's words, oh friends, not these sounds, instead let's hear more pleasing ones and more joyful. After that is when Schiller's poem begins. So again, uh, the musical chaos then interrupted by the bass soloist. <laughs> 
important line here is all men will become brothers. This symphony is Beethoven's expression of universal brotherhood, the ideals of the enlightenment. The rest of the movement presents variations on this beloved theme sung by soloists or the choir. I want to play just uh, one more short section in which Beethoven expresses this wish in uh, musical terms. About halfway through the movement, we get a variation that is in the form of a march of military music, uh, but specifically through the instruments he uses, uh, Beethoven evokes a Turkish march. This is something that we don't recognize today, but it was a popular musical reference in the 18th and early 19th century. So Beethoven's audiences would have recognized it. In the text, we see why Beethoven makes a march of this, like a hero to victory. But why a Turkish march? Well, Vienna was besieged by the Ottoman Turks in 1529 and 1683, and closer to home, invaded by Napoleon's armies twice in recent memory. So Beethoven's audiences were aware of war and external threats to their city. Here, Beethoven seems to say, let's not be enemies, let's come together. We are all brothers. Beethoven was cherished as the greatest composer when he was alive, and this continued after his death. One of the other big changes that occurred in the beginning of the 19th century uh, was how people listened to music and how they made music. Uh, the middle class, the new patron of music, especially in Austria and Germany, uh, for them, being part of the educated middle class meant being educated in music, being able to play, to make music. So for Germans and Austrians, music became part of their identity and uh, music, uh, symphonic music especially. The Italians and the French, uh, they had strong operatic traditions. There was always German opera, but symphonic music, instrumental music, this was something that thrived in the German-speaking lands, and they knew this and prized their symphonic heritage. And Beethoven, with Mozart and Haydn, these three composers who lived at the turn of the century, they were the fathers of this tradition. As far as Beethoven's resonance in the 20th century, well, you've probably heard his music in many film scores, uh, not to mention the many films about Beethoven, at least 15 since 1909, and well, uh, ringtones. Uh, Beethoven's music has also been important for recording technologies. The first commercial LP back in 1931 was a recording of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. And who remembers the CD? Uh, well, when Philips and Sony were developing the CD, one of the experts involved was Herbert von Karajan, one of the most distinguished conductors of the 20th century. Legend says that he demanded that the CD be formatted 
so that the entire Ninth Symphony would fit on one disc, 74 minutes. And the Ode to Joy, uh, Beethoven's expression of universal brotherhood was selected as the anthem for both the Council of Europe and the European Union, though without words since there is no single official language in Europe. The EU says that Beethoven's symphony symbolizes the freedom, peace, and solidarity, uh, ideals also dear to the European Union. And one final thought. On Christmas Day, 18, 18, uh, 1989, uh, Leonard Bernstein held a concert of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony uh, in Berlin to commemorate the fall of the Berlin Wall. The musicians for the concert came from the two German states as well as from the four occupying powers. For this concert, Schiller's words were changed from Freude, joy, to Freiheit, freedom. that's it everyone that's the end of my presentation thank you for allowing me this opportunity uh, just one last thing if anyone's interested in uh, more uh, presentations uh, send me an email and I'll be happy to put you on a mailing list to inform you when something like this when, it, when it, the next time I do something like this when I record uh, another presentation, musical presentation like this. Even send me requests for what you'd like to have a presentation of. And if we get a critical mass, that will determine what kind of presentation it would be. So thank you very much. And now I give it over to uh, Dustin for some Q and A. Thank you so much, Michael. That was uh, fantastic. Um, a wonderful guest engagement. Thank you again, everyone, for joining. Uh, we do have some questions coming in here, so I wanted to ask you first, and you touched on this briefly, but how did uh, Beethoven record when he was deaf? How did uh, Beethoven uh, compose when he was deaf? Sorry, compose. I said record. Compose is the correct word there, yeah. Right. So, uh, for, um, as he was going deaf, like I said, we're not really sure how much he could and could not hear, but uh, supposedly when he was still uh, going deaf, you could hear the piano well enough that he could still compose uh, at the piano. Of course, that changes once his, he loses his hearing entirely. Um, now, so the, the way he was able to do it in the way that, for example, Smetana was able to do it uh, in the second half of the 19th century was uh, there's a distinction between the outer ear and the inner ear. And uh, a well-trained musician, not everyone that's a well-trained musician can do this, but some musicians who are well-trained have uh, a capacity they train their ears well enough, their muscle memory, their musical memory well enough that they can really hear everything in their head without hearing anything uh, externally, without playing the piano. So Beethoven could write down music and he, would, he, could, he could hear it in his head, essentially. So that was the way he did it, at least uh, from 1818 on. Great. Thank you, sir. To, to that end, uh, another question that came in. Um, from the movie Rocket Man, uh, it appeared that Elton John could hear a song uh, once uh, and play it perfectly from memory. Um, so was that true of Beethoven as well? Um, and what is that? Is there a phenomenon? But what is that called? If you know, <laughs> what's that called? Uh, I don't know what that's called exactly. Um, but that's it's very similar to what I was talking about before. I mean, that's that's um, having a very well developed uh, musical ear, being able to retain uh, music that you hear. Um, and Beethoven for sure could do that too. You know, one of the things that he would do would, you know, he would hear something once and he would, he would play it, he could repeat it, but then he could extemporize on it, you know, make up new music on it. Um, and as far as that goes too, you know, I mean, a lot, I mean, a lot of it depends on how complicated the music is. 
uh, how well someone, whether it be Beethoven or Elton John or, or anyone really, uh, how well they could reproduce a song that they heard. You know, a lot of music uh, is built up of particular patterns, of repeating patterns, uh, relationships. And once you have those basic principles down, and if you have enough of a fluency with the piano, then it becomes easy to, that's how you start making progress towards uh, being able to do that kind of, that kind of thing. Great, thank you. Uh, in Vienna, what is the venue that connects best to Beethoven's life? Yeah, so that's great. So yeah, you want to you know you want to visit these historical cities and you want to retrace the lives of uh, these composers. And uh, there are a couple of great museums, uh, Beethoven uh, Beethoven's residences that was turned into uh, museums. One of them is uh, the house he stayed in in Heiligenstadt. Uh, Heiligenstadt, remember I mentioned the Heiligenstadt Testament. We call it that because he wrote that when he was staying in Heiligenstadt, the sub, one of the suburbs of Vienna. So that's now a museum. You can go visit uh, that house. Um, another one of the houses that Beethoven lived in for a very long time is now called the Pasqualati House. It's also a museum. You can go visit that. They have an exhibition of, of Beethoven's life uh, and, his, and his, some of his works and what he was doing when he was living there. Um, if I'm not mistaken, if you go to, I think, the um, Vienna's tourism website, I think they have a Beethoven walk or something, so you can really walk in his footsteps. Um, but, you know, the, the unfortunate fact is that Vienna is, is just very different than it was when Beethoven was living there. So if you, we want to go to sort of retrace uh, Beethoven's footsteps, we can only go so far. You know, Heiligenstadt, for example, it was in the suburbs. Beethoven would go there in the summer to get away from the noise and the stench of the city to be more in the countryside, uh, but it's not the countryside anymore. I mean, it really feels like it's part of the city. So the city has changed so much that we really have to use a lot of our imagination to sort of fill in, fill in the gaps. Great, thank you. Hey, here's a fun one. Was Beethoven manic depressive? Was Beethoven uh, manic depressive? Um, well, <laughs> I, I really don't know. And, you know, it's, this is, I mean, we know that Beethoven, I mean, his moods certainly went uh, up and down. Um, he, he, when you listen to the way that, from reminiscences from his friends, the way he acts, uh, you know, sometimes he, he does seem to, to, to live, to express himself on, on, on extremes. Um, but, you know, whether he's manic depressive, I mean, I don't know. You know, I mean, this is a case of trying to take, um, you know, psychology or, or as a note, a knowledge of the psychology as we know it today and trying to bring it back um, into the into into the past. And that's always a, a tricky situation. So it's possible maybe he was, but we really can't say without without any certain any certain. Okay. Um, here's a good one. Um, from earlier when you shared that uh, drawing of the men listening in the parlor, um, it seems that that instrument was a harpist chord. I'm sorry if I'm uh -huh. not pronouncing that right. Did Beethoven compose for that instrument or primarily pianoforte? Primarily for uh, the pianoforte. So yeah, by the time that Beethoven was composing, it really was, um, I mean, not the piano as we know it. I mean, that took, you know, another 50 years to become the piano that we know it for today. But yes, uh, the, the forte piano, uh, where it was not, you know, the harpsichord has got the pluck strings, where the piano has got, got the hammers, but Beethoven was performing primarily for uh, the, the, uh, the forte piano. Now, what's interesting is that um, if you read a little bit about the history of piano building, um, you know, they, they were, piano makers were constantly trying to make their instruments stronger, have a fuller sound, and, you know, they were sort of always following on the heels of some of these performers, some of these composers, like Beethoven. You know, Beethoven was always trying to make his music louder. Beethoven was always, you know, putting a lot of energy and violence into the pianos, breaking the pianos. So this helped the piano makers try to th think of solutions to make stronger pianos and to send the Beethoven pianos uh, to help help him, you know, um, spread their name and their pianos. Okay, a couple more here. Um, not sure if uh, you might know this one, but do we know the value of the Beethoven estate bequeathed to Carl? Yeah, no. Um, you know, Beethoven's affairs are are, are very are very weird. Um, you know, he uh, on the one hand, as soon as he moved to Vienna, and I mentioned he was friends with these princes, and they just showered gifts on him, and he really lived like a prince in some ways. You know, at one point he had a horse and everything, and Beethoven he had a, a servant his entire life. He had servants. So on the one hand, he seemed to have had a lot of uh, of money from these gifts. 
he was publishing a lot of music. So he was making music uh, through publishing and through doing his concerts. And then on the other hand, uh, we hear about Beethoven uh, also being in debt or borrowing money from his friends and his publishers. Um, so we're not really, sh his finances are a little bit vague. At one point when he was doing well, he, he bought shares in a bank, bank shares. And I think this, um, this was his most valuable um, asset uh, when he died that he left to his nephew. But what the value of that was, I don't know. And then again, you know, and then it's a case of, you know, transferring monetary value currency from here to now and trying to understand what, you know, what is 1,000 florins? What is that? What does that mean? So anyway, the short answer is it's kind of yeah. mysterious. We don't, right. he, there was something, but we don't know exactly, exactly what it was. Okay. All right, for the last few minutes, we'll try to tackle uh, one or two more. Um, was the ninth the only work with vocal? No, uh, Beethoven wrote a lot of vocal music, uh, actually. Um, a lot of songs, uh, opera he wrote, oratorio. So he did write a lot of uh, vocal music. The ninth symphony is the only symphony, uh, strictly symphonic composition that has uh, voices. He did write another work earlier, about 20 years before that, he wrote uh, a work called the, the Choral Fantasia, which is kind of like a forerunner to the Ninth Symphony. It starts off with a long virtuosic uh, piano passage for Beethoven that Beethoven would have played. And then the symphony, the uh, instruments come in, the orchestra comes in, and then there's a chorus at the end. But it's not a symphony, strictly speaking. It's one movement. It's a, it's a fantasy. It's a fantasia. Uh, so a lot of vocal music he did write but the Ninth Symphony, the only symphony with, with voices. Okay, maybe one more if you could handle it for us real quick, Michael. You bet. Um, we're going, going back to the deaf thing here. Is it true that uh, Beethoven became more deaf as he wrote more music in lower registers that he could pick up easier through floor vibrations? Um, did, as he was going deaf, did he compose more music in the lower registers? I, have, I'm, I don't think so. I don't think so. And I haven't, uh, I have, don't remember ever reading anything to that extent. Um, no, I'm going to say no. No, I don't. Okay. It, it is true that as his deafness progressed, it was the higher tones that he had a hard time hearing first. That is true. But whether that influenced the kind of music he was composing, I don't think so. Okay. And one, sorry, one more quick one. Did he ever marry? Um, and did he ever have children? Uh, he did not. He did not marry. No. Uh, and he did not, so he didn't know, he did not have children. Um, he, but he, he had Carl, his nephew, who became his ward, you know, kind of, uh, you know, I think Beethoven, you know, perhaps, um, you know, part of this uh, guardianship battle was Beethoven's struggle to have a family and to be a father. Um, you know, Beethoven had um, a pretty bad experience uh, with his own father, you know, Beethoven, you know, maybe he wanted to be a father, be a better father, you know, raise a son better than, you know, who knows. Uh, but th there was that, there was Carl. Now what's funny is that uh, Carl had a bit of a crazy life. He ended up uh, moving to America for a time and he said he was Beethoven's son um, to try to get money. But, um, but no, but Beethoven, no, no children, no, no marriage. Didn't ever, never work out. All right. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Um, I know this was incredibly enjoyable. We got a lot of really great comments from guests. Thank you all for joining. Uh, we really appreciate your time and for taking um, the time out of your schedule to engage with us. And um, again, Michael, fantastic. We appreciate it. And anything you'd like to say in closing? Just thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And thanks for listening. Great. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day and a great weekend.